Okay, in this video, I'm going to show the math behind a common and basic form of motion capture that you can do just with a regular camera. And we call this frame differencing, uh, or maybe absolute difference. I'm going to build it up just from scratch here so you can really see how it works from the bottom up. So the first thing that we're going to need is some sort of video to look at. And what I'm going to do for that is just a jit.grab object, which digitize video live from an external source, uh, as you can see, as it says right here. Um, and by default, it's just going to use the built-in webcam that you have on your computer. This reads uh, open and close messages to actually access the camera. So if you had other cameras that you wanted to hook up, you could also read them with jit.grab. Uh, I need a metro here. I'm going to use a Q metro. It's a Q-based metronome, really similar to metro, but uh, allows to drop packets uh, if it gets overloaded. So there we go. Uh, sorry about that. I need an argument. So let's say something like 30. It says every 30 milliseconds. Good enough. All right. And so we've got uh, jit.grab is going to grab our video. I'm opening and closing it. And then I can also uh, send a bang to it every 30 milliseconds asking to update the frame and then I also need some place where I can actually see the results here. So I'll grab a jit.p window and connect that up to my grab just so we can prove to ourselves it's working. When I hit open, if you are on a Mac uh, or you have an indicator light of some sort that your webcam is on, oh, there's a tiny version of me, hello. Uh, then you'll see that come on and then you'll see yourself moving live. So there I am. I'll go ahead and close that and turn it off for right now. Move to this to the side. So in order to do motion capture, we have to do some processing onto this live video stream that we're working with. Um, and the first thing that we need to do is we need to make it black and white. We have right now four channels, um, red, green, blue, and alpha and we want to make it actually monochrome. So one way that we could do this in Jitter is with the RGB to Luma object, which uh, converts RGB to a monochrome matrix. So uh, just instead of going into my P window, first I will take my grab and go straight into my Luma, and then we'll leave that there so that we can see the results of it. Go ahead and open that, turn that back on so you can see what's happened now in black and white there. Okay, so now we have this matrix that is only black and white, which means we're representing each pixel with just one value between 0 and 255. So this is 8-bit data. And what that means is that I have the ability now to look at every frame of my live video feed and actually compare it to the adjacent frames, the ones that are next to it. And if I see between every pixel, let's say I take two adjacent frames, and I look at the corresponding luminance values for each pixel in those adjacent frames, and I look at the difference between those values, so difference uh, is actually subtraction, right? So I can actually do a subtraction here between these values. Remember, it's just a number between 0 and 255. I can take the difference and I can look and see how much different the pixel in one frame was to the next frame. And if I think about that, the difference uh, in that number is corresponding to something that changed in my actual frame. So it's essentially motion. And I can then say some some threshold of difference that I want to call motion. So what I'm going to show you is how in Jitter to actually look at these two adjacent frames, subtract their values, um, display that, set a threshold, and then calculate the motion from there. So what we need is an object that can actually calculate the difference between our two adjacent frames. Now we could use subtraction, but what we Really, we don't want negative numbers, we want the absolute value. And there's an object called absdiff, and it's actually uh, just a version of the jit.op object, which you can just type in jit.absdiff. Just note if you click uh, absdiff help, you actually get jit.op coming up, and uh, it explains it here in the operators tab. 
All right, and so what this is gonna do is take two frames and find the difference between them. So then how do I actually get two adjacent frames? Remember, these are coming really, really quickly, somewhere between 24 and 30 frames per second. Um, depends on your settings. So what you can do is use a trigger object, and T uh, is the shorthand for triggered. What we're gonna do is say T space, and then lowercase l, lowercase l for my arguments. What this is gonna do is it's gonna take one frame and send it out of the rightmost outlet, order one list, and then the next frame and send it out of the first or leftmost outlet. So what I'll do is just spread this out so you can see. There we go, connect that up. So I've got one frame here and then I'm taking the other frame here, subtracting that. All right, and uh, let's grab a duplicate P window so that we can see what's actually happening out of our abs diff to see if it's working. Turn that on, press play. Cool, let's see. So you can see that as I'm moving a little bit, you can see some white grayish frames showing up down in that P window. All right, and what that is, is it's, it's displaying the numbers, the actual difference, right? So if it's a lot of difference, if uh, you subtract, let's say 255 from uh, 10, you get a value of 245 and that's being displayed uh, in that pixel in that resulting frame over here. So this is the difference, not what's actually happening, but the actual difference frame between each adjacent pixel. Um, and then the next thing that I want to do is set some sort of threshold so that I can say, well, there's a little bit of change here, um, but not that much change. And so I don't want to call that motion. I'm going to do that with a threshold object, jit dot greater than. This is, a, again, op. Um, and my uh, I'm going to flag that at a value of 60, just to start out with. High enough that I think we're going to get a, a good mix, get rid of all of the extraneous values, but still keep most of our meaningful motion. Just connect that up so you can see what's happening there. Open, Q Metro, awesome. All right, seems a bit more responsive. Um, and the, the other thing that this does, this greater than object actually, is it looks for values that are greater than 60. So these are pixels that are um, between zero and 255. So anything that's greater than 60 the, this jit uh, dot greater than object is going to set to white and anything that is less than that is going to set to black. So it's making these binary values. I either have in this, um, in this final output matrix a pixel value of 0 or a pixel value of 255. And then the last thing that I need to do for my basic sort of uh, original raw motion value is uh, just count these up. If I count up the number of white pixels, which we're calling motion, um, and uh, I have a decent picture of how much motion is happening in the view of my camera at any given time. I'm gonna do this with jit.3m. The three Ms are minimum, mean, and maximum values. And we will feed our matrix into here, and the second outlet is the mean, which is what we want. So this one is actually taking, uh, it's going to take an average of all of the pixels that are currently in the scene. And remember, I just have two options, black or white, um, and so uh, my output value, the max is going to be 255 and the min will be zero. Um, and the, the closer it is to 255 here, that means the more motion that we have. In general, you're not gonna see, you know, much higher than 100, um, 120, and in, in darker rooms, darker settings, it's uh, gonna be even lower. So let's zoom in just a bit so that we can see this value. Okay, and 
as I'm moving, you see that float down at the bottom kind of popping up. Cool. So this is raw data and it is really, really jumpy because this is giving me a value every single frame. And we don't really want our data to be this jumpy. We need some way to actually smooth it. So there's an object called slide, which smooths values logarithmically. The first argument that you use is the for the slide up. This is a float. Um, and the second is for the slide down. So I like to be a little faster um, at, at the beginning, maybe a 10, 5, something like that. Um, and then 20 for sliding back down, at least for this type of uh, work that I'm doing. And we will see what the output is here. And then just to make this a little easier, since float values are kind of see, kind of difficult to see, especially it's going to be difficult on a video, we're going to grab a multi-slider and go out to your inspector. Multi-slider is going to allow us to visualize these peaks of motion. So floating point is good, slider style. What I want instead of thin line is line scroll. Okay, and then for my range, we'll start at zero and we will go ahead and go up to one and drag this out. And actually let's make two of these so that we can see our smooth values versus our not smooth values. All right, turn this on. Okay, so on the right hand side here, I have my smooth values and on the left hand side I have not smooth values. So I'm just going to wave my hand in front of the camera. Okay, so on the left you can see all these peaks uh, with the, these gaps in the middle. And if we're using this to control some sort of media output, these gaps are going to cause us some big problems. Um, and if we smooth it more uh, sort of mountainy um, over here, this is going to help us out quite a lot, especially for media output. Okay, and so I'll just show you one really simple example um, of some media here. Just grab a... sound file um, here is a nice beat where's my beat go low beat okay. and an easy deck and a gain slider Actually, let's do a live gain. So live gain, you can set with a parameter value of negative 70 to six. So this goes in decibels. So if you see, I scroll this down, right down to negative 70, this arrow right over here just went down. So I'm controlling the volume level here. I guess I should connect these up or they're not gonna work. Okay. So rather than just use this value with my mouse control here, maybe I want to use the motion that I am taking in and calculating here. Um, and so the way that I do that, right, if I just take this and I connect it up, the values that I want here are negative 70 to 6, and that is not at all what I'm getting here. So I have to scale my inputs to my desired outputs, and I do that with a scale object. Um, somewhere, zero is definitely my bottom here, and then top is going to really depend on the room you're in and how much motion you are tracking at a time. I'm going to try something like 20 right now, and then I want my decibels to be my output, negative 70 to 6. Don't forget your floats for the first two. And I'll just move these over to make a little bit more sense. Take my slide values here and connect up my output here. Click on this loop. 
hopefully this is not too loud. Let's play. All right, so as I move now, I should be able to control my volume. And just for the last illustration uh, of this slide and why this slide object is so important, I'm going to just take this input here and instead of using my logarithmically smooth values, just grab my raw values and show you what that sounds like. Okay, it just really hurt my ears. I'll edit it down for you so it doesn't bust your eardrums, but that's sort of what's going on there. So even if we scaled it correctly, and I don't know, this is a lot higher, so something more like 60. Right? It's still really jumpy, and you can see that with this arrow here. It's not going to work out. So we have to use our smooth values for this. And uh, my scale is too high now. So this is really simple motion capture. Again, I'm not even looking at any position tracking. I'm just looking at the overall amount of motion that the camera can see in the scene. But even though it's not very precise and you just have this sort of one value input, you can still use it for a lot of really interesting things.